All right, good morning and welcome to today's small business webinar. My name is Paul LaChapelle. I'm with MSU Extension and it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you all today. Uh, I'd like to remind you that we are recording today's uh, small business webinar and we'll be posting the archive link uh, on our website. And you can see that website link in the Q&A box there in the lower left corner. Uh, today's webinar is sponsored by the Small Business Development Centers, which are affiliated with the Montana Department of Commerce and U.S. Small Business Administration, uh, as well as the Montana Economic Developers Association, MSU Extension Community Development, with additional support from the Great Falls Development Authority and the University of Montana. Uh, if you have any tech support uh, questions, uh, you can call the number that's in the Q&A box or uh, email that address. Um, you will have an opportunity to um, ask questions or provide comments. Um, and our presenter today is encouraging questions uh, throughout the presentation with each slide. So uh, please um, ask those questions uh, via the Q&A box. Just type those into the um, uh, that chat pod again in the lower left corner. And uh, we'll uh, monitor those and, and um, respond to those as they come up. So uh, now uh, it's my pleasure to introduce today's uh, presenter. Uh, before I do that, I do want to just say a quick word about the um, uh, the PDF that you're looking at, it is available for download there in the file download box. And um, uh, my apologies that you can see the um, the wording of the uh, the next slide. Um, uh, that's just a, a, a small tech uh, issue on, on my end uh, and not the presenter's um, fault or mistake. So um, you'll see that as he scrolls through the uh, through the slides. Uh, so uh, again, now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today. Justin Jones is uh, the Associate Vice President and IT Risk Manager with DA Davidson based in Great Falls. And uh, Justin, with that, um, you can unmute your mic and go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Paul. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. And I will mention that the, the building I work in currently is undergoing construction. Hopefully I've moved to a location where we won't be impacted, but if background noise does come in. I may mute for a moment or two, let it drop and rejoin, but hopefully we won't have to. Now the purpose of this call today, we'll just be looking at some cybersecurity quick tips to help keep your company safe and secure, or maybe not your company, maybe you're here to learn how to protect yourself, your family at home. This can be applied there as well. Now we have a number of slides and topics to cover and while this won't be all inclusive as any one of these topics we can discuss for hours or even days and only scratch the surface, the purpose is to really provide some quick wins, some easy wins to make yourself more secure. So if someone does stumble upon your network or is looking to potentially compromise you or your customers, you make it more difficult. So they'll simply try and move on to the next business person, etc. little about me. As Paul mentioned, I'm currently the Associate Vice President, IT Risk Manager at DA Davidson Companies, where I oversee numerous functions, including cybersecurity operations and business continuity, or more known in the military field or military jargon as continuity of operations. Listed a few of my certifications and one thing before we dive into content is I represent myself on this call, not necessarily the thoughts and views of my employers, DA Davidson Companies or Great Falls College, MSU. So while I do work for both of these fantastic organizations, the comments mentioned herein are my own and don't necessarily reflect that of DA Davidson Companies or Great Falls College, MSU. Now, when it comes to protecting yourself, protecting files, devices, or everything at home. We typically have a focus on or are presented in the media of advanced persistent threats, APTs of sophisticated hackers that are going above all, doing all else, more or less performing magic behind the scenes to compromise victims. A lot of times this isn't the case. We can see examples such as Equifax where a simple critical vulnerability wasn't patched on a server for months that led to data being leaked out, data for many millions of US citizens 
from that site. So I always like to start the conversation of the basics. If you can do the basics and do them well, like in most professions, you will encompass 80, 90% of what you need to do and make it much more difficult for anyone to bypass your controls to get to those sensitive information files are getting to where they need to compromise your organization, your home, get in there, do destruction to your life, commit fraud, etc. So the first basic we have here is to keep your software updated. Now, this of course gets more difficult the more software that you add to your machine system. With Windows, Apple and other systems, they always have these features to automatically look for and update files where applicable. I highly recommend that. With Microsoft, they have patching monthly. It applies it. Apple and the like have very similar patch processes, so keeping your software up to date is one. But also keep in mind that Microsoft will most likely only keep your Microsoft software up to date. If you're running other software on your computer that's not Microsoft, keep in mind that you will most likely have to update that as well if you don't have an auto update feature enabled. Luckily, most of us these days rely heavily on our browsers, whether it's Internet Explorer, Firefox, Chrome, or Safari, all of which have auto update features enabled by default, and I highly recommend to keep these on and updating by default. The next basic suggestion is to back up important files. Now, as we have seen, and we'll get to ransomware and other things on other slides, the backing up of important files is critical to ensure that if something does happen, something is lost, maybe there's a fire in a building or something happens to your computer, your computer is stolen or ransomware encrypts all the files on your computer. Having a backup of these important files is a necessity to help you recover and restore and get back to business as quickly as possible, or even more so in your personal home life. I know a lot of us have lots of pictures, personal mementos and things that we store at home on our devices. If you view them as important, make sure you're backing up those files. And we'll get more into this and some other steps you can take to pr protect those files from ransomware. The next one, again, keeping with the basics, is to use passphrases. Over the years, there's been suggestions to keep your passwords complex and longer and longer and longer. And this is becoming even more difficult. The current recommendation is at least 14 characters. So whatever your password is, 14 characters in length. And if you're having to create passphrases or passwords for very different services and sites, this gets very difficult. So what I suggest is to use passphrases or if you can use password safe technologies. There's a lot of good ones out there, such as LastPass, 1Password, and KeePass. And if you're gonna use these, you know, we'll talk about multi-factor authentication here shortly. I recommend also supplementing that with multi-factor authentication so you can get in there. An example of a passphrase is to kind of keep things random and in length. Say I may have visited California in a beach on a specific year, I can kind of add these into a passphrase. I can say MT for Montana, La Jolla for like La Jolla Beach, maybe I preface a year in there, maybe it's not this year, maybe 1902 has significance with an exclamation at the end. That's going to have at least 14 characters, it's going to be complex, and it's also going to have randomization and entropy making it much harder for someone to compromise that password. The next is encryption. Now we need to encrypt our devices. All of us, I would say, have smartphones on us that can easily be stolen. On our smartphones, we essentially, these are computers and we store our lives on them, whether it's calendars for work, personal lives, photos, etc. it's all on those devices. We wanna make sure that we're enabling encryption and you can find how to encrypt this from manufacturers' websites, whether it's Google for Android devices, Microsoft for Windows phones, or Apple for iPhones. Last but not least, when we're talking about basics, it's to use multi-factor authentication where applicable. Now, if this is a new 
term for you. I suggest that you look at it as multi-factor strengthens our passphrases or passwords. So what it does is essentially if someone gets your username and password, they also need to compromise this multi-factor authentication device. Now we can find these these multi-factor products out there. A common one is Duo, D-U-O, that was re recently acquired by Cisco is a great one. Microsoft has an authenticator. RSA has a good authenticator device. I can't remember if I mentioned Google yet. Google has an authenticator. There's a lot out there. They work on almost any site universi universally. And if you look at the link below, it provides a good list of sites that offer multi-factor authentication and where you can use it, I strongly suggest to use it. I'll pause for a brief moment before moving on if there are any questions. All right, so after we've done the basics, we move on to some of the the tactics, techniques, and procedures known as TTPs that we look for. And the first one in the most common way attackers try to get in these days is through phishing. There's also other deviations from phishing. One is vishing. It's with a V because they're using voice or phones. So we, we get these on our phones or scam calls all the time. These can be known as vishing. There's also spear phishing, which are targeted phishing emails. And here's some just simple red flags to look for with phishing attacks. Now, the first one is an unrecognized sender, or I have strange here in italics, a strange email from a recognized sender. If there's a sender you work with and you see a strange email coming up from a strange time, keep in mind that their email or account could have been compromised or hacked. The next thing they'll do a lot of times is they'll ask you to do something outside your normal job responsibilities. An example of that is executive compensation at larger organizations. If you're the business owner, you have employees working for you, is here's the compensation for all the employees. You know, open this file. That's asking you to do something outside your normal job responsibilities. And many of us, this is juicy detail that we might want to see, but keep in mind that that's how they get us. They, they What we call is they hijack our amygdala or they get us to essentially bypass our logical thinking in order to open that email and give us whatever information they need. The next common tactic that people will use is they'll put your email in the BCC line. This is most often done as they're not just sending it to you, they're sending it to multiple people. What they've done and a lot of threat researchers in the industry have found as a common way that they can see emails that are phishing emails as they're sending it to more than 25 recipients and they're putting these recipients in the BCC line so they're hidden. So blind carbon copy, if you're not quite sure what that is, we have a CC line where you can put people in, but blind carbon copy essentially puts them in there and you can't see who is being sent to. Why are they doing this? Well, they're sending it to different people at different companies and if you could see this, you would know that it's not a legitimate email. And some don't put it in the BCC line as we look in the next line here. If you're not in the BCC line and it's a strange list of people that you're usually not on emails for, know that that's another good red flag. Bad grammar. Uh, grammar is getting better. We don't quite see as many Nigerian Prince emails today. They're getting a little better and more sophisticated. However, they still do come through with some fairly bad grammar. And last but not least is urgency. You know, a common tactic today is I need you to go to the store today. I'm the CEO. I need you to go to the store. I need you to pick up $1,000 worth of gift cards, scratch off the number, send it to me. I need it today. Do it now. So they're often stressing urgency. So again, they get you out of your thinking. There's another list or even more red flags at the link below. If you click it, go to the website or know before there and you can read a lot more of tactics and other things that attackers may try to do to pass off a, a phishing email as a legitimate email. I'll pause again for a few seconds if there are any questions. Justin, I just uh, posed one um, in the Q&A box. Um, this might be a little bit unrelated, but do you know how the new law that's going to be reducing robocalls might influence security threats? 
and I think it's uh, this is going to be difficult to tackle and I'm not sure if the law is going to have any impact on it. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of the robo callers are already breaking the law and I'm not sure if they're going to be able to crack down. So what we see from this and we see it a lot of times is robo callers, they'll find VoIP lines, which is voice over IP. So of course, like Vonage would be a popular VoIP provider and they essentially provide a block of numbers that are unallocated. So a number that's not in use and those robocallers will simply grab these numbers and send them out. I don't really think that it's going to have much effect on that, though I'm passively optimistic that it'll have an impact is that's a difficult problem to crack down on and I don't think that this law is going to have any impact on it personally. I will mention though one last thing that I mean there are some apps out there that help protect you. Hiya is a good one, H-I-Y-A as well as Truecaller. However, if you do have privacy concerns, I wouldn't necessarily use those as one way they use in order to better protect everyone is they'll grab all of your phone numbers and everything that you have stored in your contacts in your phone. So if you're not comfortable giving this out to strangers or a, a provider, I wouldn't do that for myself. I don't use these technologies for that reason, but some people do find it helpful in combating some of these vishing or spam calls. Okay, so as we alluded to earlier, kind of goes along with phishing is business email compromise. So, and we see this quite frequently is in order to say attack someone, if I wanted to attack Paul, who just kind of mentioned that comment there, I might find someone who Paul regularly communicates with. I attack that email address, I get it, and now I need to get to Paul somehow. I can use this trusted partner to try to attack Paul. And this is a very common tactic that we see, and it leads to many phishing attempts and even further breaches of personal information. So just because an email came from a trusted partner, really try to be careful, and if you see it come through, it's not something you typically do with them. They're trying to send you a bill. A lot of times we see a, please open this bill, it's due now. Well, you don't handle billing or do anything with this person. Please be aware of that. If you see that and you know the person's phone number, we recommend calling them directly to verify. And if it's not, they should be aware there's other people you may want to notify, other customers, partners, and you can even report that to a few places, the ic3.gov or report phishing at apwg.org. Um, the apwg.org is a anti-phishing working group that does a study and continually do better ways to combat the phishing problems that we see out there. I do mention uh, some email security. If there are any technical folks on this call, I won't dive into it right now, but SPF, DICM, or DKIM, and DMARC are great ways that if you are an email administrator or maybe your business relies on Office 365, it would be worth mentioning to Microsoft or whoever your email provider is if you can put these technical controls in place to better secure your email system at your business. Any questions on business email compromise? All right, next is ransomware. And this has been, of course, trending for the last few years. And I think most of us have maybe not been the victim of ransomware, but have certainly seen it in the news. And we discussed kind of the previously, the phishing emails is still one of the most common ways all malware, including ransomware, infects our machines. Another common way, of course, is infected websites. And keep in mind, this could be a legitimate website you go to every day. I know we've seen it at our organizations here of getting infected or people being infected years ago because they visited a legitimate website to view the menu for a local business. Of course, they didn't quite have the email secure or not email security, website security set, set up properly. So when anyone went to that, browsed that site, they got hit with ransomware. Another common tactic is, of course, ad space on these sites. Some sites 
or most sites out there are free. So in order to generate revenue, of course, they have ads. And these ads are a common tactic others use to launch ransomware on your machine. So back to how do you protect yourself from ransomware? Again, back to the basics. That's the best way to do it. And then backups. Now, one thing I will caution with backups is offline backups are usually the best strategy to handle ransomware. If you have backups or you're replicating backups quite frequently, it is entirely possible for them to go in, the ransomware encrypts the files on your machine, and then will reach out to other files on other servers, or maybe you have one drive in the cloud and it goes through and it'll affect your one drive in the cloud. For, so for that reason, I do recommend not only backups, but also offline backups at routine intervals. The next is awareness and planning. You know, awareness to make your employees aware of how ransomware gets in. It's from these, you know, the phishing email threats, visiting infected websites and ads. So making sure that if you have employees, they're not just mindlessly surfing websites as the more websites they're searching or looking at, the higher the probability is that you may be infected with ransomware. And next I say planning. When it comes to cybersecurity and being breached, it's not a matter of if, but when. So if it does happen, you are infected with ransomware and it takes down machines. What is your plan to get your business back up and running as soon as possible? Or how do you continue your operations, whether it's going back to paper and pencil and carrying through or other ways? Keep in mind, if you're reliant on technology to get, do your job or to further your business or just carry out basic business, what can you do if it is infected or goes down? The next is, of course, immediately disconnect infected devices. This kind of goes to backups or if you have mappings. I know a lot of larger businesses, we have mappings to file shares or home directories where we store files and ransomware knows that. So it quickly reaches out to these and encrypts them, right? This is why the offline backups is important. So if this does happen, immediately disconnect those infected devices from the network or Wi-Fi, however they are doing or however they are connected into your network. Next is contact the authorities. The recommendation is your local FBI office and also notify your customers if it's possible that you're going to be down and can't service, service them in a, a reputable time. Now the, the one I have here mentioned, Cerberus on the side, was an, an interesting one. Interesting as it's actually an Android banking Trojan. So. I also mentioned it is, it is currently sold on the dark web as malware as a service. So if you find yourself on the dark web, you can actually purchase the Cerberus for essentially malware as a service. So if you want it for three months, it'll cost you 4,000. If you want it for a year, it'll cost you 12,000. Now they don't necessarily disclose what your payout may be at the end, but if you're looking to get into the illicit ransomware game, keep in mind it is out there, though I'm sure none of you are out there, but also keep in mind that they make it easy for people who want to get in there to use this ransomware malware as a service to generate revenue for themselves. Any questions on ransomware? So Gloria, with Oh, yeah, cool. With cloud storage on your files, you can kind of disconnect from that. So you can disconnect OneDrive or backups periodically and then reconnect when you need to back them up and then disconnect. So that is, a, I think that'd be a good way to, to help that. It's just you have that way to disconnect or essentially then it protects you for more unless you have those backups that are then offline so you're not automatically connected to them. Uh, Paul, many apps ask for permissions to access your cell phone location photos. How can we ensure we are not compromising our personal data? So this goes back, of course, to the basics, making sure you have strong passwords, encryption, etc., and be very careful of all the applications you install on your phones. For me, I use a minimum set of applications on my phone. As, as you mentioned, Paul, many apps ask for permission for a variety of things. And unfortunately, some apps have access to all that without asking for it as well. So just be cognizant of what applications you're in installing and what they have access to. And if they have access to this, 
of course, they're pulling it off your phone, storing it elsewhere, using it to sell to other third parties potentially. And it is mentioned in most of their privacy policies. So definitely be aware of what you're installing on your phone, what their privacy policies are and how they're going to use your information. Does Google Play ensure safe apps? Uh, no, <laughs> they're working on cracking down that and getting better, but it's just because it's in Google Play or in the Apple Store doesn't necessarily mean it's safe. Research the app. Again, look at the privacy policy, look how they're going to use your information and look at the permissions they're going to be needing, needing on your phone in order to work. Great questions. So tech support scams. Again, this kind of falls under our vishing. So this would be known as a vishing attack and we've seen these quite frequently and they come in, right? Typically they are tech support. You'll get a phone call. The next thing they do is they, they need to install this remote access software on your computer because it has malware or there's even larger threats a lot of times as you have child pornography on it. We need to contact the FBI or you can let me install this remote access software on your phone and I'll take care of it. So after they get on, they get this remote software installed, then they usually install persistent malware. I say persistent in this versus just malware as persistence essentially means that it's going to survive reboots. You can reboot your computer multiple times, that malware is still on there. And with that malware, of course, there are payloads, the things that actually do damage is the malware itself in this case is simply a connection to the, your machine. What they do after that depends on their payload, which may be, may be just unnecessary software that they're then going to charge you annually, monthly, whatever they want. And they should sell you repair services or have unnecessary maintenance programs or a lot of times it's just to grab your personal information. Maybe the payload of this malware is a key logger so they can grab your, your login information to your bank site then they can then get to your bank site and pull out whatever funds they want. But also keep in mind, this is why we say install multi-factor authentication. So then if they do grab your username and password and you're using a multi-factor application, they can't necessarily log into your bank account. So it does protect you in those ways. And these are quite common. We see them luckily by about the time it gets down to them asking to install remote access software, people are cognizant to the fact that it is a scam and disconnect at that point but we still see these and far too often than I'd like to. Any questions on tech support scams? Wi-Fi security. Now with the internet, it's we have to be connected everywhere all the time and Wi-Fi makes that very easy. You can go to almost any business these days and find Wi-Fi, whether the business is running the Wi-Fi or whether someone close by is. And what I do recommend that if you do have a business is you lock it down. You're using Wi-Fi protected access to WPA2 or the newly WPA3 that just came out. This will help you ensure the connection is safer than WEP or not using any secure connections. If you are going to jump on public Wi-Fi, if it is available, I recommend using a virtual private network. You can go out there, you can find VPN solutions. I will caution from using free VPN solutions and the one I recommend and use is PIA, which is private internet access. And I actually use it all the time, not just on public Wi-Fi, but all the time. For this call, I'm using it whenever I'm surfing the web, even at home. I'm using a virtual private network solution. The next is most of our routers these days are access control points for our Wi-Fi allow us to separate our guest and our business networks. Now say you own and operate a coffee shop, I highly suggest you have your guest network separated from your business network. It's the last thing you want to do is have someone malicious sitting in your coffee shop or next door getting into your business network, seeing card transactions, etc. And the last 
but not least is smartphones. They can automatically connect to public Wi-Fi, but if someone has compromised a public Wi-Fi site or someone's serving up malware on that, you don't necessarily want to connect. So be very cognizant, not just on smartphones, but even tablets these days are starting to automatically connect to public Wi-Fi. So be very cognizant of where you're connecting and when you're connecting. Any questions on Wi-Fi security? Okay, and last but not least, as we're just a couple minutes over here, but wrapping up is cyber insurance. Again, I'm definitely not a, a legal expert, can offer legal advice, but I do just have some, some basic coverage recommendations if you think you're a threat and if you do rely on technology or are storing sensitive customer information is Here's some clauses I would recommend looking at. Uh, data breach, cyber attacks on data held by third parties. So if you rely on third parties, such as Square, maybe if you're doing credit card processing to making sure that you're covered in those areas. Cyber attacks on your network, denial of service. If you have a website, you rely on that and it can go down, I'd recommend that. And last but not least, of course, terrorist attacks with the recent news of kind of what's going on in Iran. This is, of course, being closely paid attention to as we progress day by day. With that, I'll open it up to, I guess, one last round of questions, like a couple people are typing. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Gloria. Um. Just One thing I, I didn't quite cover that I'll just mention really quickly, of course, is ATM credit card skimmers. I'd recommend looking that up for the sake of time. I didn't quite include them. But if you do have an ATM or you suspect there may be a skimmer, look it up. Look what they look like. They're very hard to find and detect, and you just have to stay vigilant and keep your eye on. Uh, you are mentioning something, Paul? Yeah, I was. Um... Uh, I'll give you a chance to read Jason's uh, question uh, there about um, uh, how to reach out to you if they have additional questions um, with an email address or a, a phone number if, if you're comfortable giving that information out. Uh, my question is um, often small businesses um, provide, you know, lots of information about, you know, the location, how to contact them. Is there information you'd suggest on their websites that they either um, maybe not – not, not provide or or um, be careful about how they provide it. Um, I'm thinking specifically an email address and um, and how easy it is to just kind of um, take that up if they use the the at symbol as opposed to something else. Um, so again, just what to provide on a website and what what to think about maybe um, uh, not providing in terms of um, information about a small business. Right. This all depends on what your risk tolerance is if you're okay with that going out. I would be very careful and not suggest that you tie it to your personal name. So for me, I want to put a Justin J. Justin, are you still there? We might have lost you, Justin. I can't hear your audio. And it looks like we might have lost Justin. Um, not sure what happened, but um, um, we can certainly uh, share Justin's um, contact information via the listserv if uh, he's comfortable with that. So I'll get confirmation before we send that out. Um, I know Justin said that they were doing some construction at his... Uh, uh, the location he's presenting at, so we may have um, may have been an issue. Um, we hope that it wasn't a cybersecurity issue on his end. So um, I guess with that, um, I'll thank you all for joining us uh, for today's uh, small business webinar, and um, we'll be announcing our February uh, and other spring webinars, uh, uh, winter and spring webinars, uh, very soon. So stay tuned for more information about that, and we'll be posting the link of the. Uh, this recording archive um, on the west, uh, website and listserv um, later today or tomorrow. So uh, with that, um, we thank you again for joining us and we'll see you at the next small business webinar. Thanks everybody. Bye now.